need me. Okay, in a minute. Okay. Okay, good evening, viewers. A warm welcome to the Extra Mural Lectures webinar series 2020. We have been presenting lectures to provide you exposure with a blend of information. Today we have with us Ms. Ladiga Nath, known as India's Tiger Princess, being an Indian author, a photographer, and a wildlife conservationist. She has been working for the conservation of tigers since 1990s. Graduated in environmental science from the University of Delhi, Ladiga Nath obtained her DPhil at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, Christ Church, Oxford. And so thus she became the first woman and Indian to have a doctorate on tigers from the University of Oxford. She has authored books uh, like uh, Omo, Where Time Stood Still, A Journey to Where the Wild Things Are, Takdir, The Tiger Cub, and so on. She is bestowed with an honorary title, Her Daringness, and also awarded the Karma Veer Puraskar in the field of environment and conservation. So her life and work has been featured on National Geographic Television in a documentary called The Tiger Princess and also in the Discovery Channel. So today she will be sharing with us her views on the topic Big Cat Conservation Challenges and Future. Ma'am, we are honored to have you in this lecture. So we welcome you to the webinar. Thank you so much. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm just, it's so wonderful to be addressing a group of bright young people. Um, and you guys are really the future of India. So delighted and honored. Um, very different to engineering, but I hope you'll enjoy what I have to say. Um, so should we begin now? Is this okay? Yes? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go. Okay. All right. Um, I want to. Can you see my screen clearly? Oh, uh, ma'am, not yet. Not yet. Can you see it now? Can you see my screen? I can't hear you. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. You, I can. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the great cats, conservation challenges, and their future. Um, a lot of people ask, what are the great cats? And um, what are we, why are we so concerned about them? Well, the truth is that the great cats are the thermometers to the health of an ecosystem. And um, it's by preserving the great cats that we know that we've conserved uh, the entire ecosystem and it is in prime condition, giving all of the services that an ideal ecosystem will give all of the living species in that ecosystem. Now, what are the great cats and how many of them do we have here? Uh, there's a lot of debate about the definition of a great cat or a big cat. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, I would like to cover lions, leopards, snow leopards, tigers, pumas, cheetah, uh, clouded leopards, and the jaguar. So um, I started off really early um, with this passion for the big cats. One of the newest cats that I've discovered recently is um, the jaguar. There are less than 64,000 jaguars left in the world today. Um, and they're primarily found in South America and the America, North America, South America. This is the leopard. There are less than 10,000 leopards left in the world. Leopards are found in Asia and in Africa. Uh, the puma, the mountain lion, the cougar, the cat with many names. Less than an estimated 50,000 of these cats remain in the wild. Uh, they're primarily found again in the Americas and there's several subspecies in them. And the snow leopard, we're not sure of how many they are, but definitely less than 10,000. We guess somewhere between seven to 8,000 um, is, is the number that we 
we think is more reasonable. They're found in all of the countries that have the Himalayas in them. And they really are the guardians of the high mountains, the Himalayas, the guardians of the third pole. The clouded leopard, a very elusive, very secretive species uh, with a vast range. It covers a lot of area in, in South and Southeast Asia, but very, very few uh, really large populations remain. And we, we think there's somewhere sort of between under 10,000 left in the wild now. There's been a dramatic decline in lions, um, maybe 20,000 left now. Uh, even since the turn of the century, we've lost a huge number of lions. Uh, you have, of course, the African lions and the Asiatic lions. And then the greatest of the great cats, the tigers. Now, tigers, less than 4,000 left in the world, if you put all of the populations together. Not very positive numbers when you think that we have 1.2 billion people in India alone. Cheetahs um, declining rapidly again, about only about 7,100 um, left. But it's not all been bad news. There's been some good news in the recent years about um, the big cats. One of them, um, and very excitingly, was that the black leopard has been discovered after nearly a hundred years in Africa. This is an incredible, incredible photograph taken by Will Burrard Lucas um, using one of his camp traptions, which is a very interesting little device and you should look it up. Um, and, and this was taken in the Laikipia region in Kenya. We also had an amazing discovery about tigers in snow. Everybody's always thought that there were only tigers in Siberia, but that's not true. We have tigers in India in snow as well. And this exciting uh, photograph was taken by two researchers from the Wildlife Institute of India in the Mishmi Hills in Arunachal Pradesh. And this is the highest record we have in India of tigers. There's also been other bits of positive news. The Asiatic lion is coming back to Iran after almost 80 years. Uh, at one time, there was this debate about whether India should give Iran some Asiatic lions in return for some Asiatic cheetah, uh, which is the only big cat that has become extinct in India in the last 100 years. But it didn't go through and uh, the exchange never happened. But the Asiatic line is now coming back to Iran. And that's really, really exciting news. On the other hand, in India with the Asiatic lion, uh, we've, we actually identified and created a new park called Kuno. Um, and Kuno is ready for the introduction of lions. Uh, and the Supreme Court recently gave an order saying that the lions should be returned, uh, which should be introduced to Kuno. But uh, the Gujarat government hasn't really followed up on this and neither has the government of India. So this is actually a contempt of court because a direct order from the Supreme Court is not being followed. And it's just been very frustrating. There's a lot of people going to court. There's a PIL, there's lots happening, but no movement on this. And we do hope that something will happen because this year and the last year, we've had uh, really, really uh, sad incidents where there's been a lot of canine distemper and uh, we lost over 120 lions to this. And one thinks and one weeps within to think that these lions could have been introduced to Kuno. We would have had a second stable population of lions. And, uh, you know, following that famous adage of don't put all your eggs in one basket, we would have had a backup plan, a plan B. But that never happened. And we lost um, many, many uh, lions. Uh, to, to canine distemper. 
there's been uh, a lot of threats to cats all around the world and uh, you know the lions i told you had there's been a rapid decline and people often wondered why there's this rapid decline there's been a lot of poaching there's been a lot of hunting there's been a lot of illegal uh, culling and killing of lions and this has uh, really been a huge 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 problem uh, on the one hand there's been a, a lot of talk about uh, the fact that trophy hunting annually contributes huge amounts of money uh, to the to the african economy and it supports the conservation of other species but uh, there's been a lot of debate on whether the economic benefits of trophy hunting are really as much as people make it out to be and is it really as useful as it could be so there's been a lot of people pro hunting and there's been a people a lot of people against hunting and the debate still continues till today to figure out what the correct way forward is now coming to the cheetah the, there's less than a hundred asiatic cheetah today they went extinct in india in the early 1950s Today, the Supreme Court has given orders for the reintroduction of cheetah in India. And there's been a lot of debate on whether this, uh, the, the current thinking about introducing uh, the, the South African cheetahs into India is really a good thing, or we should actually sit and wait for the cheetah to come in from Iran, which is the only last remaining hold of cheetahs. Even in Iran, it's not been uh, really, really uh, good news because there's been a lot of, uh, you know, decline in the Iran species. And there was a team of people working in Iran, a team of scientists, and uh, they were they were documenting them using camera traps and doing some incredible research on how these animals are surviving in these tough conditions. But then suddenly the Iranian government arrested all of the researchers saying that they uh, were spying on the country. And uh, six out of eight uh, Iranian wildlife conservationists charged with spying have been sentenced from four to 10 years. And this has caused a huge uproar in the conservation community, leaving many of us very shaken because this is just showing you how uh, the government can actually take action against uh, researchers and stop research um, in, in a place like Iran. But it's not just uh, issues like, you know, a, like a small population and hunting of cheetahs that is the problem. Cheetah babies are so cute that uh, people have been wanting to keep them as pets. And uh, you keep seeing pictures of how mothers are killed and the babies are taken away from mothers and uh, supplied, uh, especially in the Middle East and in state, uh, countries like America, to uh, the rich and famous as pets. And if you look at these pictures, you'll see uh, how uh, the mothers are killed, taken away as trophies, and uh, the babies are taken away and uh, kept now these are these are people who are hunting cheetahs um, as as uh, trophies but uh, you know it's it's not just about trophy hunting that's the only threat and it's not about poaching it's not always due to just um, man it's also uh, cheetahs are the smallest gentlest and most fragile of the big cats in the african scenario and they get bullied by the lions, they get bullied by the leopards, they get uh, bullied by hyena, and um, will often uh, get killed by lions or leopards, um, or even a pack of uh, wild dogs or crocodiles. Uh, this photograph on the left is a picture of one of the, uh, the last kings of Ethiopia and his pet cheetahs, and the ones on the right are showing you how it is in the middle east today this is today you can go into the middle east and find these rich um arab sheikhs with pet cheetahs in their cars um and of course uh you know there's there's 
all of the problems uh, that cheetahs are also uh, killed by ranchers because they predate on their livestock. Now, predator compensation is... Uh, something that we talk about a lot in the conservation world uh, but it's not always possible to give a hundred percent compensation for every animal that has been killed by a big cat uh, and the cheetah problem was getting really really bad especially in countries like namibia and then uh, they wanted to find a way of minimizing the damage caused by cheetah to livestock uh, so one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Dr. Lori Marker, um, introduced uh, the Andalusian uh, sheepdog and uh, they guard the livestock and prevent cheetah from predating on them. The effect of this simple reintroduction of this dog uh, has resulted in Lori being able to reduce mortality of cheetahs due to hunting by rangers by almost 70 percent and uh, it's made a big difference in namibia and she's doing all of this incredible work now to look at the other other issues including uh, the traffic and poaching of cheetahs in namibia now moving from cheetahs to pumas now pumas are the latest love of my life i went uh, to meet some pumas last year i traveled across to chile um, and went right to the end uh, it's it's almost at the end of the country um, 185 kilometers from antarctica uh, this wonderful place called the torres del paine national park where i met 17 pumas over the course of a month and i walked with the pumas i got as close as five feet to a puma. I photographed them um, on foot, face to face, and I just absolutely could not believe that you could do this with wild cats. Uh, but it, it happened and it's just magical. And it was while that I was, th I was there that I started to examine what was happening with, uh, you know, puma conservation in, in that part of the world. Now in Patagonia, uh, pumas have been uh, really protected uh, to a large extent because of, tour of tourism and uh, wildlife photographers going in to the area and really supplementing the local e economy. But the protection granted to pumas is leading to a conflict with ranchers because pumas are going uh, out of the Torres del Paine park and the Chile's government, Chilean government is allowing ranchers to kill the puma if it, they can prove that it has killed their livestock. Now this is a, a terrible, terrible situation and uh, there's been a lot of work and a lot of research now on trying to minimize this conflict to see what, what can happen. Uh, so there's, you know, it's it's really, uh, you know, the the best of the best eco-friendly, uh, responsible tourism-based uh, adventure uh, tourism-based hotels that are coming up in the area that are now working with the local communities and the ran ranchers to prevent uh, further puma uh, uh, wildlife conflict, uh, puma and uh, livestock conflict, sorry, in uh, Patagonia. Uh, this is a magical picture. Uh, this was taken by the National Geographic photographer Steve Winter in Mumbai. And uh, as many of you will know, um, Mumbai has a huge population of leopards, as does most of the big cities in India, as do most of the rural landscape of India. And these uh, leopards have been living on the edge of Mumbai, coming into the city, uh, working their way around people and uh, living primarily of dog and pig and um, little um, animals that live in and around human habitation. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate on whether we should have leopards, whether they can turn into man-eaters, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, how does it affect uh, people. 
Uh, during the pandemic, of course, we saw a new side of the lepers because lepers started seeing that there were not so many people on the streets and they started coming out and you started seeing them everywhere all across the length and breadth of the country. They were out in the day, they were going into schools and legislative assemblies and walking on the streets and wandering into, uh, you know, colonies and even crossing uh, flyovers. But uh, this was not because they've just come into the town because of the pandemic. It, they, it happened because they were always there, but because we were off the streets, they decided that they could come out in the day a little more. What was horrific, of course, was the reaction of people to the leopards. And these poor leopards had really not done anything, but people just almost always end up killing them. And um, it's just, it's terrible when this happens. And one of the things that I really spent a lot of time on during the pandemic was talking to people and telling them what to do if a leopard comes into their space, um, how to share their area with a leopard without conflict. Now, it's not only the leopards that were coming out, it was also our lions. I mean, there were leopards in, in the cities, but there were lions in Gujarat, in the docks, on the roads, uh, you know, climbing on top of little temples. Uh, you just saw them everywhere. Um, sadly, that's not only, you know, restricted to the big cats like the puma, the leopard, the lion, but also um, one of the most harmless of the cats, the snow leopard. The snow leopard, you know, is a cat that has never been known to in knowingly cause a human death. There's never been an attack on a slow, snow leopard, uh, which has just been a snow leopard going out to attack a human. It's always been even the one or two cases when a human being has been injured has been because a snow leopard has been caught, cornered and is trying to get away. And a lot of snow leopard trade and uh, poaching is happening all over the, its range today. And you can see from these images just how bad it is. They catch the animals, they, they use the pelt. Um, it's, it's just been really, really bad. But the snow leopard, I think, is the cat that's the most affected by climate change. Um, it it's, lives in the, the, right at the top of uh, the Himalayas and in the snow belt. And as climate change is affecting uh, the ice and the patterns are changing of not only the weather, but also uh, of the glacial melting and what is happening, uh, the animals that are getting the most affected is the snow leopard. So we've really been talking about what is happening and what we need to do about um, snow leopard protection and, uh, you know, how to give it the, a fighting chance for survival. Now, um, snow leopards uh, are gaining a lot of support uh, from villagers who live and share the spaces with them. And this is because the whole concept of homestays has been introduced in many of the snow leopard regions across the world. And these homestays allow villagers a source of income that they never had access to earlier. This is all for tourists who want to see snow leopards, but also wildlife filmmakers and photographers, researchers, uh, people who want to get a glimpse of the little seen cat. And uh, there's been a lot of initiatives and uh, conservation uh, based activities done by the communities which live in snow leopard territory. So this has been very, very positive um, in, in recent times. Sorry, the last of the cats that I'm going to talk about is the clouded leopards. Now the clouded leopards live across a huge, vast area of India and Southeast Asia. But we know very little about it. It's it's terrestrial to, for a large part of time. Um, it's, it lives in thick 
uh, rainforests where you don't see it very much. Um, we've started doing some wonderful research on clouded leopards here in India and in Nepal. There's been a lot of interest in what is happening. And one of the most exciting things that happened with the clouded leopard was that we found a new species. Um, they found that the Borneo clouded leopard is actually a completely different species. And this was in 2007. And uh, this was just really one of the biggest things that happened in the big cat community uh, when this, this um, was decided. So we've been um, looking at what is happening with the clouded leopard and um, saving forests um, have really, really, really helped um, saving populations of clouded leopards that would have other been, otherwise been uh, totally wiped out. Now, clouded leopards are also prone to a lot of, of poaching, a lot of hunting, a lot of killing. They're also the apex predator of their ecosystem. They're sort of the equivalent of tigers for those forests. And uh, when, when you disturb the balance of uh, an ecosystem uh, by removing the top predator, the whole ecosystem goes into turmoil. And uh, horrifically, in one single park in Cambodia. Uh, the rangers and researchers from WWF found over 100,000 snares in one forest at one given time. It's just absolutely astounding that that level of poaching and, and human activity is happening and nobody has been able to stop it. Now, jaguars, um, have been affected a lot in South America by what's going on. Uh, they're powerful, mystical beasts that used to be prayed to um, as gods by the Incas, by the Red, by the Red Indians, by a lot of people uh, of the native communities. Uh, jaguars traditionally, again, have been, um, uh, uh, you know, subjected to a lot of killing by. Uh, ranchers and uh, trying to protect them, uh, their own cattle. Uh, but lately, they've also been affected a lot by uh, the clearing of the Amazon rainforests to grow fodder for all of the cattle that is being farmed there. Uh, there's been uh, some work now in places like the Pantanal, where uh, tourists are now going in to see uh, the jaguars and there's been a new, new source of income uh but but the hunting continues and it just is it's it's terrible but it's not just the hunting as we speak today there's a huge problem with fires that are being set in the pantanal region and so many animals have got burned it's just been horrific uh the president of Brazil is not doing enough to stop this. A lot of these fires in recent times have been made, uh, have been caused due to human um, activity and illegal migrations and encroachments onto those forests. It's um, something that um, has been really, really impossible to show the world. Uh, just how bad it is. These are two images which will show you how much deforestation is happening and what, um, how much of the area was burnt um, in recent years due to fires. This is a picture showing you how um, huge tracts of forests are cleared and culled uh, for human activity and growing crops. Now, half the world's ecosystems are at risk from habitat loss from climate change, from um, clearing uh, for agriculture. And, uh, you know, desertification is changing the way an ecosystem functions um, in many, many parts of the world. Now, if you look at this, you look at this map, it shows you, um, you know, uh, commodity driven deforestation, shifting agriculture, bad forestry practices, fires, development and urbanization all affect um, 
the 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 forest cover of the world and are driving uh the decrease of uh you know uh habitat for availability for the big cats in india of course recently we had a lot of uh, positive news and a lot of media coverage talking about uh, how tigers have gone up and it's uh, we met our goal and we're um, you know doing really good because the goal was to double the population by 2022 which is the next year of the tiger but uh, we've done it well in time but the point is 3000 tigers is really is that something to celebrate is that really a viable population for the long term? We're not sure. I don't think so. I think we can do a lot better. And I think we need a lot more work from the government um, in collaboration with private communities, the private sector, with researchers, and uh, working across boundaries with other tiger nations to make sure that we stop the horrific decline of the big cats. Um, tigers traditionally avoid contact with human beings, but when humans encroach into their space, sometimes they have no choice. And you've been seeing all of these images of man-eating, tigers getting killed, man-animal conflict, uh, all sorts of horrific things during the pandemic. And it's just been going on and on and on. So there's been a lot of debate about whether we should be allowed to protect ourselves against these cats. But it's not really the cats that are coming to get us. It's us that are going into the cat's territory and exposing ourselves to what's happening. So we've been talking about tourism um, and, and how wildlife tourism uh, could create uh, a very positive trend for wildlife conservation in the country. Um, wildlife tourism has been growing almost 15 at 15% 15 annually. Um, a lot of people are going into parks. Uh, um, the majority of visitors to the parks are Indians, but we do have visitors from um, across the world. Now, the government hasn't really done tourism, wildlife tourism uh, management the same way that other countries do it. Um, they've been very successful with some species um, and a lot of focus has been given on some parks, but it's not been uh, distributed equally across all parks. So we have some parks that are very neglected and others that have had a huge amount of attention. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of studies talking about um, how the tourism based industry, uh, which is the hoteliers, the airlines, the transporters can come together with the forest department to find a solution where we can spread the benefits of tourism, not only to just the famous tiger reserves, but also all of the lesser known areas. Now, tourism like everything else comes with its pros it comes with its cons and it, one of the recent debates um in has been about uh you know how gypsies should uh how how safari vehicles should uh go and uh do a safari what is the distance they should maintain how much they can hound an animal whether elephant safaris are good or bad whether uh, you should get rides on elephants off the road to go in a park to see tigers as they have been traditionally. Uh, there's also been a lot of uh, change uh, in conservation techniques. There's been a lot of change to using technology. We now have night vision cameras, um, using a lot of camera traps. They're now using drones. Uh, there's been all sorts of exciting movement. These are the camp traptions. Um, that have been made uh, to allow you to go right up to animals and photograph behavior that you wouldn't normally be able to see uh, because you're right up close. But there's been also a, a great movement on the part of the wildlife photography community to bring across a message of what is happening with wildlife conservation and big cat conservation in particular. Uh, people 
using photography as a means for engaging with the public through social media and to garner support for uh, wildlife conservation projects. This is a incredible set of images by Nick Brand uh, to show you where the lions used to roam and they no longer roam. And as they say, an image is so much more powerful than the written word. Look at, uh, you know, how clearly it says that. Um, there's also been a lot of work on looking at how development is fragmenting uh, habitat for wildlife. And one of the ways that habitat gets fragmented is by the creation of roads. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of uh, coverage in the media about um, uh, road kills and how um, there's been a lot of wildlife killed on, on highways. And we've been now looking at um, underpasses, overpasses, and what to do to minimize the damage. So there's been a lot of research in, in uh, several wildlife institutes um, all across the world and a whole genre of studies that looks at all of this um, and, and looking at design considerations for wildlife crossings, looking at pre preemptive planning rather than uh, dealing with the situation after it happens. Um, so this is this is areas of um, you know how we need to uh, figure out all of this. This is a map that shows you um, the distribution of wildlife conflict incidents for different countries, and you can see countries like India have some of the highest um, human wildlife conflicts uh, that are reported. But equally interestingly, so does um, the U.S. Now, of course, we're all just beginning to learn how to deal with the pandemic and uh, the whole COVID uh, lockdown that happened. Now, we've in the past few years already uh, suffered from five major zoonotic diseases, Ebola, rabies, avian influenza H5N1, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and the Rift Valley Fever. We haven't learned. We still have wildlife wet markets. We have uncontrolled bushmeat extraction and the spread of zoonotic disease. We now have a new word, zoonosis. And it's, it's something that's come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a new disease that's been talked about, the Kyasanur forest disease. It's been a wake up call for how we live with and how we treat wildlife. We really need to examine our own lifestyles and see what we're doing to the true nature. We've always tended to think we're superior to nature and we can control what's going on. And I think the pandemic has very emphatically proved that we're just one of the species that live on Earth. And we cannot control what is happening. And are we really going to learn from what we've suffered the past few months? Are we going to be prepared for future epidemics? Are we going to predict what is happening? It looks very difficult when you look at the fact that we keep huge populations of animals like the feral dogs, um, and, and the big, the monkey populations in cities, and they all carry rabies, they carry uh, distemper and other diseases, um, not only to um, wildlife, but also to uh, human beings. And uh, this has been a huge issue with, um, you know, uh, even a, a, a rabbit dog biting a tiger on its tail in Panna. So these are all issues that we deal with. We're of course talking of things like rewilding uh, to increase uh, the forest cover across the world. And of course, in India, um, we've been talking about reintroductions of the big cats in areas where we've lost local populations and we need uh, to reintroduce uh, species. 
and this has been true for tigers it's been true for for lions it's been true for the cheetah in different parts of the world but it's not just the reintroduction of animals that we're talking about we're also talking about the fact that sometimes we do need to understand that there have to be spaces which are inviolate from human presence kept only for wildlife so there's been this great debate of what's been happening uh you know whether it's good or it's bad to move people out of parks but we've always we've come to the conclusion that some areas need to be free of human presence and when done right village relocations can be really really useful so this has been a, a lot of things uh, to think about a lot of movement happening on how we tackle um, issues of human wildlife conflict it's a time of great change a time of great introspection a time to think of how long will we allow the great cats to continue to walk the earth Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for you, your insightful lecture and presentation. presentation. This truly really will help us to analyze and digest, digest the importance of uh, such, such a big resource and the challenges faced by it. By it. So, so um, now we now move on to the Q and A session. Sure. sure. So uh, there are we have got a bunch of questions from the audience. We want to address one of them. Okay. Uh, is the Indian National Park environment completely suitable for Asiatic cheetahs? Are there any natural threats to them? Um, cheetahs need specialized grassland environments. Since we had cheetahs here in the past, um, yes, we have habitat for cheetahs, and we have the prey base. uh there's no problem on that we're just reintroducing a species that was wiped out and like i told you we've already had uh, uh cases of you know even in panna and sariska where tigers were reintroduced so there's been no problem about ma'am sorry that. to and interrupt you that, uh, cheetahs yeah uh, ma'am your uh, screen is being shared can you please stop it yeah okay is that okay fine better yes, yes yeah yes okay okay so um what i was saying is that yeah we it, we're just uh, literally just introducing a, a species that was there earlier so it should be no problem at all uh, for cheetahs to come in so moving on to the second question mm -hmm. Uh, could you uh, please could you comment on the comment on the Sakyadri Tiger Reserve? Is the real threat for tigers in that region? Given that there is a lot of habitat or destruction. Sorry, say that again. Which tiger reserve? I it you're breaking up. It was Sakyadri Tiger Reserve. Yeah, I think all. Um, I mean, absolutely. I think it can happen. You just need motivation on the part of the local government. and very importantly the local politicians you also need a huge program of awareness to plan development um activities in the region uh national parks can exist everywhere i mean you have a national park in the center of bhopal called vanvihar uh, vanvihar which is doing so well so i don't think that's an issue i'm sure it will be okay if if you can actually get uh, various government departments uh the bureaucrats and the the political uh leadership uh to come together and and work at it uh with a cohesive uh strategy thank you ma'am ma moving on to the third question considering current climate of deforestation and habitat loss in india how severe is the problem and how you see future of wildlife in india so um it's it's one of those things that people say it's beyond amazing that we still have the amount of wildlife that we have considering that we have the size of the population that we have uh but i think as a nation as a people we always uh learned to live with uh you know the outdoors and nature and wildlife and we worship 
animals and we respect uh, mother nature it's a part of our culture so i think uh, there's great hope i'm very optimistic i think we're doing well we're going to do better uh, i think there's a huge need um, i keep coming back to the same thing to increase political awareness uh, to increase um, you know i would go so far as to say maybe we should have um, orientation programs for every member of the legislative assemblies and the parliament so that they understand um, better the need for conservation and the fact that ecosystem protection and um, improved economies go hand in hand they're not two different things they're just two different things that support each other to help a nation move forwards moving on to the next question uh-huh uh, how's, your how's your experience working with international organizations like UNDP, IUCN, UNFP, and mm -hmm. IMO? Okay, so um, I did a lot of consultancy work for them. We did some really, really good projects. But I, as a person, wanted to work on the ground at the grassroots level. And when you work with the UN and you work with all these organizations, you don't end up doing quite so much hands-on grassroots level work so that was my call um however as i said to you before they've, there's been some really fantastic projects that i've been a part of um and i think they have a really important role to play so it's been a good experience and i've you know uh, made many good friends and colleagues um in my time there thank you ma'am thank you ma'am uh, uh, moving on, on to the next, next question. question. Can you Can point you out your policy regarding the environment and which you see as a threat to your vision or which is supportive? Sorry, say that again. You broke. What okay, was before sorry. supportive? Uh, which you see as a threat to your vision or which is supportive? The government okay, policy. so there's been a lot of. There's been a lot of attack on the Wildlife Act right now, and we're very worried about what is happening. There's been a lot of talk about introducing policies which will undermine the basis of the Wildlife Protection Act. And we've been very, very, very worried about that. Um, and um, on the positive side, uh, there's been a lot of uh, support from the state governments um, for this uh, Supreme Court ruling that banned, for instance, green felling in India. So that's really supported, uh, you know, the protection of wildlife and its habitat in India. So that's two acts that I've talked about. Okay, next question. Okay, next question. Mm -hmm. How important do you How feel is the role of feminists and uh, wildlife role in feminism and, and wildlife conservation? And what are some perspectives that women can open up in the present context? So I think um, I would go so far as to say I don't want to talk about a gender-based thing because I don't think there's any uh, need to do that. Okay, anybody who is passionate about the outdoors, um, regardless of age, regardless of uh, nationality, regardless of uh, gender, can make a huge difference. And it does not even have to be a scientist, or it does, and it doesn't have to be a conservationist. Every human being can make a difference, and um, I think there's a role for everyone in the protection of the environment, which includes men, it includes women, it includes students, it includes um, children, you know, absolutely everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Next, mm -hmm. Next question. What has fascinated what you has and Raven towards Raven exploring toward wildlife photography? And what would and you what advise would you people advise interested people in making such, such, such a change? Okay, so I did a lot of photography right from the beginning, right from when I was a child. Um, and of course, I used uh, photography to record uh, behavior when I was doing my doctorate. But um, 
it's a tough field uh it doesn't pay very well uh there's limited uses and and purchasers for wildlife images um so you need to be somebody who's very dedicated very passionate and uh somebody who's willing to go the extra mile it's not an easy profession you work in crazy temperatures you're away from home i mean there are times when i travel as much as 8 months of the year and i'm home just for a few days between trips um so you need to understand that you'll not be in cities you're not going to have malls to go to you're not going to have cinemas to go to you're not going to have um the same sort of life that normal people in metropolitan towns have uh it's you're going to be working in really harsh conditions uh it could be you know in blazing sun it could be in freezing cold it could be uh in, in drought it could be that you have to sit and wait for hours and hours and hours every day just to get a glimpse of the animal and even then you may not get a glimpse uh there's no retakes there's no posing um it's a one off if you get one chance at something and you miss the chance you'll never get it again because you don't know whether you'll see that behavior again so it's um it's just you have to be very very sure that this is what you want to do and be really dedicated also your your equipment is normally really expensive because you need big zoom lenses and um you really need to invest in equipment so it's 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 a lot of lot of lot of commitment that we're talking about here okay thank you ma'am okay, thank you Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts are your on thoughts the shoot on site order to combat poaching and legal immunity from guards using arms? Is this a viable way to detect poaching given the reports of killing innocent lions? So I think uh, shoot on site orders are very important in some places under some some circumstances. It's not like a blanket thing. I think, um, for instance, Nepal. has shooted site orders and the army protects its national parks but then this is the army we're talking about and they're trained how to handle these situations we had a case of shooted site orders being given to protect rhinoceros in northeast india um some uh, several decades ago and this was really important because at that time um if they hadn't done this we would have lost most of the rhinos in the country there are also shooted site orders in uh, parts of africa uh, to protect their rhinos and their elephants so i think it's really important but you need to know that you're using properly trained people and they have the ability to choose um how to deal with the situation and have fast reaction time um when it's needed thank you ma'am thank you ma'am uh, mm-hmm. how can the how youth, can the youth use their time like vacations etc right to contribute to wildlife conservation are there any are there any programs in india for that not really not you see a lot of the parks all of the parks in india are governed by the government they're not uh private so you can't really go and do stuff um uh, within parks but on the other hand we have like i've been talking about in my presentation we have so much wildlife around us where we live and i think if uh, the youth become involved with that and start programs where they educate uh communities they to start off with their own own community um you know start monitoring what is happening what birds are there what animals are there whether you're seeing big cats whether you're seeing jackals uh what changes are happening um and then then getting the community together to become more eco friendly to look at reducing um things that are adding to global warming um looking at helping people to combat climate change i think all of that can really make a difference and i think um all of you as students can really do a lot about that okay ma'am thank you for that that was the last question, last question. with that we are concluding the webinar thank you so thank much you so ma'am ma'am we are truly thank honored you. to have you hosted you your thoughts thank you thank you so much it's been a pleasure yeah your thoughts were indeed inspiring thank and thought provoking i would also like to thank the viewers for joining in thank you thank you so much thank you
Bye-bye. Bye.